The Last Apprentice, The Revenge of the Witch, Disc 2. Chapter 5. Boggarts and Witches. We were heading for what the spook called his winter house. As we walked, the last of the morning clouds melted away, and I suddenly realized that there was something different about the sun. Even in the county, the sun sometimes shines in winter, which is good, because it usually means that at least it isn't raining. But there's a time in each new year when you suddenly notice its warmth for the first time. It's just like the return of an old friend. The spook must have been thinking almost exactly the same thoughts, because he suddenly halted in his tracks, looked at me sideways, and gave me one of his rare smiles. This is the first day of spring, lad, he said. So we'll go to Chippendon. It seemed an odd thing to say. Did he always go to Chippendon on the first day of spring? And if so, why? So I asked him. Summer quarters. We winter on the edge of Angle's Ark Moor and spend the summer in Chippendon. I've never heard of Angle's Ark. Where's that? I asked. To the far south of the county, lad. It's the place where I was born. We lived there until my father moved us to Horshaw. Still, at least I'd heard of Chippenden, so that made me feel better. It struck me that, as the spook's apprentice, I'd be doing a lot of traveling and would have to learn how to find my way about. Without further delay, we changed direction, heading northeast toward the distant hills. I didn't ask any more questions, but that night, as we sheltered in a cold barn once more and supper was just a few more bites of the yellow cheese... My stomach began to think that my throat had been cut. I'd never been so hungry. I wondered where we'd be staying in Chippenden, and if we'd get something proper to eat there. I didn't know anyone who'd ever been there, but it was supposed to be a remote, unfriendly place somewhere up in the fells, the distant grey and purple hills that were just visible from my dad's farm. They always looked to me like huge sleeping beasts, but that was probably the fault of one of my uncles who used to tell me tales like that. At night, he said... They started to move, and by dawn whole villages had sometimes disappeared from the face of the earth, crushed into dust beneath their weight. The next morning, dark gray clouds were covering the sun once more, and it looked as if we'd wait some time to see the second day of spring. The wind was getting up as well, tugging at our clothes as we gradually began to climb and hurling birds all over the sky, the clouds racing one another east to hide the summits of the fells. Our pace was slow and I was grateful for that because I'd developed a bad blister on each heel. So it was late in the day when we approached Chippenden, the light already beginning to fail. By then, although it was still very windy, the sky had cleared, and the purple fells were sharp against the skyline. The spook hadn't talked much on the journey, but now he sounded almost excited as he called out the names of the fells one by one. There were names such as Parlick Pike, which was the nearest to Chippenden. Others, some visible, some hidden and distant, were called Meller Knoll, Saddle Fell, and Wolf Fell. When I asked my master if there were any wolves on Wolf Fell, he smiled grimly. Things change rapidly here, lad, he said, and we must always be on our guard. As the first rooftops of the village came into sight, the spook pointed to a narrow path that led away from the road to twist upward by the side of a small, gurgling stream. My house is this way, he said. It's a slightly longer route, but it means we can avoid going through the village. I like to keep my distance from the folk who live there. They prefer it that way, too. I remembered what Jack had said about the spook, and my heart sank. He'd been right. It was a lonely life. You ended up working by yourself. There were a few stunted trees on each bank clinging to the hillside against the force of the wind, but then suddenly, directly ahead was a wood of sycamore and ash. As we entered... The wind died away to a distant sigh. It was just a large collection of trees, a few hundred or so maybe, that offered shelter from the buffeting wind. But after a few moments, I realized it was more than that. I'd noticed before from time to time how some trees are noisy, always creaking their branches or rustling their leaves, while others hardly make any sound at all. Far above, I could hear the distant breath of the wind. But within the wood, the only sounds to be heard were our boots. Everything was very still a whole wood full of trees that were so silent it made a shiver run up and down my spine. It almost made me think that they were listening to us. Then we came out into a clearing, and directly ahead was a house. It was surrounded by a tall hawthorn hedge, so that just its upper story and the roof were visible. 
From the chimney rose a line of white smoke. Straight up into the air it went, undisturbed, until just above the trees the wind chased it away to the east. The house and garden, I noticed then, were sitting in a hollow in the hillside. It was just as if an obliging giant had come along and scooped away the ground with his hand. I followed the spook along the hedge until we reached a metal gate. The gate was small, no taller than my waist, and it had been painted a bright green, a job that had been completed so recently that I wondered if the paint had dried properly and whether the spook would get it on his hand, which was already reaching toward the latch. Suddenly something happened that made me catch my breath. Before the spook touched the latch, it lifted up on its own, and the gate swung slowly open as if moved by an invisible hand. Thank you, I heard the spook say. The front door didn't move by itself because first it had to be unlocked with the large key that the spook pulled from his pocket. It looked similar to the one he'd used to unlock the door of the house in Watery Lane. Is that the same key you used in Horshaw? I asked. Aye, lad, he said, glancing down at me as he pushed open the door. My brother, the locksmith, gave me this. It opens most locks as long as they're not too complicated. Comes in quite useful in our line of work. The door yielded with a loud creak and a deep groan, and I followed the spook into a small, gloomy hallway. There was a steep staircase to the right and a narrow, flagged passage on the left. Leave everything at the foot of the stairs, said the spook. Come on, lad, don't dawdle. There's no time to waste. I like my food piping hot. So, leaving his bag and my bundle where he'd set, I followed him down the passage toward the kitchen and the appetizing smell of hot food. When we got there, I wasn't disappointed. It reminded me of my mam's kitchen. Herbs were growing in big pots on the wide window ledge, and the setting sun was dappling the room with leaf shadows. In the far corner, a huge fire was blazing, filling the room with warmth, and right in the middle of the flagged floor was a large oaken table. On it were two enormous empty plates, and at its center, five serving dishes piled high with food next to a jug filled to the brim with hot, steaming gravy. Sit down and tuck in, lad, invited the spook, and I didn't need to be asked twice. I helped myself to large slices of chicken and beef, hardly leaving enough room on my plate for the mound of roasted potatoes and vegetables that followed. Finally, I topped it off with a gravy so tasty that only my ma'am could have done better. I wondered where the cook was and how she'd known we'd be arriving just at that exact time to put out the hot food ready on the table. I was full of questions, but I was also tired, so I saved all my energy for eating. When I'd finally swallowed my last mouthful, the spook had already cleared his own plate. Enjoy that, he asked. I nodded, almost too full to speak. I felt sleepy. After a diet of cheese, it's always good to come home to a hot meal, he said. We eat well here makes up for the times when we're working. I nodded again and started to yawn. There's lots to do tomorrow, so get yourself off to bed. Yours is the room with the green door at the top of the first flight of stairs, the spook told me. Sleep well, but stay in your room and don't go wandering about during the night. You'll hear a bell ring when breakfast's ready. Go down as soon as you hear it. When someone's cooked good food, he may get angry if you let it go cold. But don't come down too early either because that could be just as bad. I nodded, thanked him for the meal, and went down the passage toward the front of the house. The spook's bag and my bundle had disappeared. Wondering who could have moved them, I climbed the stairs to bed. My new room turned out to be much larger than my bedroom at home, which at one time I'd had to share with two of my brothers. This new room had space for a bed, a small table with a candle, a chair, and a dresser, but there was still lots of room to walk about in as well. And there, on top of the dresser, my bundle of belongings was waiting. Directly opposite the door was a large sash window, divided into eight panes of glass, so thick and uneven that I couldn't see much but whorls and swirls of color from outside. The window didn't look as if it had been open for years. The bed was pushed right up along the wall beneath it, so I pulled off my boots, kneeled up on the quilt, and tried to open the window. Although it was a bit stiff, it proved easier than it had looked. I used the sash cord to raise the bottom half of the window in a series of jerks, just far enough to pop my head out and have a better look around. I could see a wide lawn below me, divided into two by a path of white pebbles that disappeared into the trees. Above the tree line to the right were the fells, the nearest one so close that I felt I could almost reach out and touch it. I sucked in a deep breath of cool, fresh air 
and smelled the grass before pulling my head back inside and unwrapping my small bundle of belongings. They fitted easily into the dresser's top drawer. As I was closing it, I suddenly noticed the writing on the far wall in the shadows opposite the foot of the bed. It was covered in names, all scrawled in black ink on the bare plaster. Some names were larger than others, as if those who'd written them thought a lot of themselves. Many had faded with time, and I wondered if they were the names of other apprentices who'd slept in this very room. Should I add my own name, or wait until the end of the first month when I might be taken on permanently? I didn't have a pen or ink, so it was something to think about later, but I examined the wall more closely, trying to decide which was the most recent name. I decided it was Billy Bradley that seemed the clearest and had been squeezed into a small space as the wall filled up. For a few moments, I wondered what Billy was doing now, but I was tired and ready for sleep. The sheets were clean and the bed inviting, so wasting no more time, I undressed, and the very moment my head touched the pillow, I fell asleep. When I next opened my eyes, the sun was streaming through the window. I'd been dreaming and had been woken suddenly by a noise. I thought it was probably the breakfast bell. I felt worried then. Had it really been the bell downstairs, summoning me to breakfast, or a bell in my dream? How could I be sure? What was I supposed to do? It seemed that I'd be in trouble with the cook whether I went down early or late, so, deciding that I probably had heard the bell, I dressed and went downstairs right away. On my way down, I heard a clatter of pots and pans coming from the kitchen, but the moment I eased open the door, everything became deathly silent. I made a mistake then. I should have gone straight back upstairs, because it was obvious that the breakfast wasn't ready. The plates had been cleared away from last night's supper, but the table was still bare and the fireplace was full of cold ashes. In fact, the kitchen was chilly, and worse than that, it seemed to be growing colder by the second. My mistake was in taking a step toward the table. No sooner had I done that than I heard something make a sound right behind me. It was an angry sound, there was no doubt about that. It was a definite hiss of anger, and it was very close to my left ear, so close that I felt the breath of it. The spook had warned me not to come down early, and I suddenly felt that I was in real danger. As soon as I had entertained that thought, something hit me very hard on the back of the head, I staggered toward the door, almost losing my balance and falling headlong. I didn't need a second warning. I ran from the room and up the stairs, then halfway up, I froze. There was someone standing at the top, someone tall and menacing, silhouetted against the light from the door of my room. I halted, unsure of which way to go until I was reassured by a familiar voice. It was the spook. It was the first time I'd seen him without his long black cloak, he was wearing a black tunic and gray breeches, and I could see that, although he was a tall man with broad shoulders, the rest of his body was thin, probably because some days all he got was a nibble of cheese. He was like the very best farm laborers when they get older. Some, of course, just get fatter, but the majority, like the ones my dad sometimes hires for the harvest now that most of my brothers have left home, are thin, with tough, wiry bodies. Thinner means fitter, Dad always says, and now, looking at the spook... I could see why he was able to walk at such a furious pace and for so long without resting. I warned you about going down early, he said quietly. No doubt you've got your ears boxed. Let that be a lesson to you, lad. Next time it might be far worse. I thought I heard the bell, I said, but it must have been a bell in my dream. The spook laughed softly. That's one of the first and most important lessons that an apprentice has to learn, he said. The difference between waking and dreaming. Some never learn that. He shook his head, took a step toward me, and patted me on the shoulder. Come, I'll show you around the garden. We've got to start somewhere, and it'll pass the time until breakfast's ready. When the spook led me out, using the back door of the house, I saw that the garden was very large, much larger than it had looked from outside the hedge. We walked east, squinting into the early morning sun, until we reached a wide lawn. The previous evening I'd thought that the garden was completely surrounded by the hedge, but now I realized that I was mistaken. There were gaps in it, and directly ahead was the wood. The path of white pebbles divided the lawn and vanished into the trees. There's really more than one garden, said the spook. Three, in fact, each reached by a path like this. We'll look at the eastern garden first. It's safe enough when the sun's up, but never walk down this path after dark. Well... 
Not unless you have a very good reason, and certainly never when you're alone. Nervously, I followed the spook toward the trees. The grass was longer at the edge of the lawn, and it was dotted with bluebells. I like bluebells, because they flower in spring, and always remind me that the long, hot days of summer are not too far away. But now I hardly gave them a second glance. The morning sun was hidden by the trees, and the air had suddenly gotten much cooler. It reminded me of my visit to the kitchen. There was something strange and dangerous about this part of the woods, and it seemed to be getting steadily colder the farther we advanced into the trees. There were rooks' nests high above us, and the birds' harsh, angry cries made me shiver even more than the cold. They were about as musical as my dad, who used to start singing as we got to the end of the milking. If the milk ever went sour, my mam used to blame it on him. The spook halted and pointed to the ground about five paces ahead. What's that? he asked, his voice hardly more than a whisper. The grass had been cleared, and at the center of the large patch of bare earth was a gravestone. It was vertical but leaning slightly to the left. On the ground before it, six feet of soil was edged with smaller stones, which was unusual. But there was something else even more strange. Across the top of the patch of earth and fastened to the outer stones by bolts lay thirteen thick iron bars. I counted them twice, just to be sure. Well, come on, lad. I asked you a question. What is it? My mouth was so dry I could hardly speak, but I managed to stammer out three words. It's a grave? Good lad. Got it first time. Notice anything unusual? He asked. I couldn't speak at all by then, so I just nodded. He smiled and patted me on the shoulder. There's nothing to be afraid of. It's just a dead witch, and a pretty feeble one at that. They buried her on unhallowed ground outside a church, not too many miles from here but she kept scratching her way to the surface. I gave her a good talking to, but she wouldn't listen, so I had her brought here. It makes people feel better. That way they can get on with their lives in peace. They don't want to think about things like this. That's our job. I nodded again and suddenly realized that I wasn't breathing, so I sucked in a deep lungful of air. My heart was hammering away in my chest, threatening to break out any minute, and I was trembling from head to foot. No, she's little trouble now. The spook continued. Sometimes at the full moon you can hear her stirring, but she lacks the strength to get to the surface, and the iron bars would stop her anyway. And there are worse things farther off, there in the trees, he said, gesturing east with his bony finger. About another twenty paces would bring you to the spot. Worse? What could be worse? I wondered, but I knew he was going to tell me anyway. There are two other witches. One's dead, and one's alive. The dead one's buried vertically, head down. But even then, once or twice each year, we have to straighten out the bars over her grave. Just keep well away after dark. Why bury her head down? I asked. That's a good question, lad, the spook said. You see, the spirit of a dead witch is usually what we call bone-bound. They're trapped inside their bones, and some don't even know they're dead. We try them first head up, and that's enough for most. All witches are different, but some are really stubborn. Still bound to her bones, a witch like that tries hard to get back into the world. It's as if they want to be born again. So we have to make things difficult for them, and bury them the other way up. Coming out feet first isn't easy. Human babies sometimes have the same trouble, but she's still dangerous, so keep well away. Make sure you keep clear of the live one. She'd be more dangerous dead than alive, because a witch that powerful would have no trouble at all getting back into the world. That's why we keep her in a pit. Her name's Mother Malkin, and she talks to herself. Well, it's more of a whisper, really. She's just about as evil as you can get, but she's been in her pit for a long time, and most of her powers bled away into the earth. She'd love to get her hands on a lad like you. So stay well away. Promise me that you won't go near. Let me hear you say it. I promise not to go near, I whispered, feeling uneasy about the whole thing. It seemed a terrible, cruel thing to keep any living creature, even a witch, in the ground. And I couldn't imagine my ma'am liking the idea much. That's a good lad. You don't want any more accidents like the one this morning. There are worse things than getting your ears boxed. Far worse. 
I believed him, but I didn't want to hear about it. Still, he had other things to show me, so I was spared more of his scary words. He led me out of the wood and strode toward another lawn. This is the southern garden, the spook said. Don't come here after dark either. The sun was quickly hidden by dense branches and the air grew steadily cooler, so I knew we were approaching something bad. He halted about ten paces short of a large stone that lay flat on the ground, close to the roots of an oak tree. It covered an area a bit larger than a grave, and judging by the part that was above ground, the stone was very thick, too. What do you think's buried under there? The spook asked. I tried to appear confident. Another witch? No, said the spook. You don't need as much stone as that for a witch. Iron usually does the trick. But the thing under there could slip through iron bars in the twinkling of an eye. Look closely at the stone. Can you see what's carved on it? I nodded. I recognized the letter, but I didn't know what it meant. That's the Greek letter beta, said the spook. It's the sign we use for a bogot. The diagonal line means it's been artificially bound under that stone, and the name underneath tells you who did it. Bottom right is the Roman numeral for one. That means it's a bogot of the first rank and very dangerous. As I mentioned, we use grades from one to ten. Remember that. One day it might save your life. A grade ten is so weak that most folk wouldn't even notice it was there. A grade one could easily kill you. It cost me a fortune to have that stone brought here, but it was worth every penny. That's a bound bogot now. It's artificially bound and it'll stay there until Gabriel blows his horn. There's a lot you need to learn about Bogarts, lad, and I'm going to start your training right after breakfast. But there is one important difference between those that are bound and those that are free. A free Bogart can often travel miles from its home, and if it's so inclined, do endless mischief. If a Bogart's particularly troublesome and won't listen to reason, then it's our job to bind it. Do it well, and it's what we call artificially bound. Then it can't move at all. Of course, it's far easier said than done. The spook frowned suddenly as if he'd remembered something unpleasant. One of my apprentices got into serious trouble trying to bind a bogot, he said, shaking his head sadly. But as it's only your first day, we won't talk about that yet. Just then, from the direction of the house, the sound of a bell could be heard in the distance. The spook smiled. Are we awake or are we dreaming? he asked. Awake? Are you sure? I nodded. In that case, let's go and eat, he said. I'll show you the other garden when our bellies are full. Chapter 6 A Girl with Pointy Shoes The kitchen had changed since my last visit. A small fire had been made up in the grate, and two plates of bacon and eggs were on the table. There was a freshly baked loaf, too, and a large pat of butter. Tuck in, lad, before it gets cold invited the spook. I set to immediately, and it didn't take us long to finish off both platefuls and eat half the loaf as well. Then the spook leaned back in his chair, tugged at his beard, and asked me an important question. Don't you think, he asked, his eyes staring straight into mine, that was the best plate of bacon and eggs you've ever tasted? I didn't agree. The breakfast had been well cooked, and it was good all right, better than cheese, but I'd tasted better. I'd tasted better every single morning when I'd lived at home. My ma'am was a far better cook, but somehow I didn't think that was the answer the spook was looking for. So I told a little white lie, the kind of untruth that doesn't really do any harm and tends to make people happier for hearing it. Yes, I said. It was the very best breakfast that I've ever tasted. And I'm sorry for coming down too early, and I promise that it won't happen again. At that, the spook grinned so much that I thought his face was going to split in two. Then he clapped me on the back and led me out into the garden again. It was only when we were outside that the grin finally faded. Well done, lad, he said. There are two things that respond well to flattery. Bogots and some women. Gets them every time. Well, I hadn't seen any sign of a woman in the kitchen, so it confirmed what I'd suspected, that a bogart cooked our meals. It was a surprise, to say the least. Everyone thought that a spook was a boggart slayer, or that he fixed them so they couldn't get up to any mischief. Who would have credited that he had one cooking and cleaning for him? This is the western garden, the spook told me as we walked along the third path, the white pebbles crunching under our feet. 
It's a safe place to be, whether it's day or night. I often come here myself when I've got a problem that needs thinking through. We passed through another gap in the hedge and were soon walking through the trees. I felt the difference right away. The birds were singing and the trees were swaying slightly in the morning breeze. It was a happier place. We kept walking until we came out of the trees onto a hillside with a view of the fells to our right. The sky was so clear that I could see the dry stone walls that divided the lower slopes into fields and marked out each farmer's territory. In fact, the view extended right to the summits of the nearest fell. The spook gestured toward a wooden bench to our left. Take a pew, lad, he invited. I did as I was told and sat down. For a few moments, the spook stared down at me, his green eyes locked upon mine. Then he began to pace up and down in front of the bench without speaking. He was no longer looking at me, but stared into space with a vacant expression in his eyes. He thrust back his long black cloak and put his hands in his breeches pockets. Then, very suddenly, he sat down beside me and asked questions. How many different types of bogot do you think there are? I hadn't a clue. I know two types already, I said. The free and the bound, but I couldn't even begin to guess about the others. That's good twice over, lad. You remembered what I taught you, and you've shown yourself to be someone who doesn't make wild guesses. You see, there are as many different types of bogot as there are types of people, and each one has a personality of its own. Having said that, though, there are some types that can be recognized and given a name, sometimes on account of the shape they take, and sometimes because of their behavior and the tricks they get up to. He reached into his right pocket and pulled out a small book bound with black leather, then he handed it to me. Here, this is yours now, he said. Take care of it, and whatever you do, don't lose it. The smell of leather was very strong, and the book appeared to be brand new. It was a bit of a disappointment to open it and find it full of blank pages. I suppose I'd expected it to be full of the secrets of the spook's trade. But no, it seemed that I was expected to write them down, because next the spook pulled a pen and a small bottle of ink from his pocket. Prepare to take notes, he said, standing up and beginning to pace back and forth in front of the bench again. And be careful not to spill the ink, lad. It doesn't dribble from a cow's udder. I managed to uncork the bottle. Then, very carefully, I dipped the nib of the pen into it and opened the notebook at the first page. The spook had already begun the lesson, and he was talking very fast. Firstly, there are hairy boggarts, which take the shape of animals. Most are dogs, but there are almost as many cats and the odd goat or two. But don't forget to include horses as well. They can be very tricky. And whatever their shape, hairy boggarts can be divided up into those that are hostile, friendly, or somewhere between. Then there are hall knockers, which sometimes develop into stone chuckers, which can get very angry when provoked. One of the nastiest types of all is the cattle ripper because it's just as partial to human blood. But don't run away with the idea that we spooks just deal with boggarts, because the unquiet dead are never very far away. Then, to make things worse, witches are a real problem in the county. We don't have any local witches to worry about now, but to the east, near Pendle Hill, they're a real menace. And remember, not all witches are the same. They fall into four rough categories. The malevolent the benign, the falsely accused, and the unaware. By now, as you might have guessed, I was in real trouble. To begin with, he was talking so fast I hadn't managed to write down a single word. Secondly, I didn't even know all the big words he was using. However, just then he paused. I think he must have noticed the dazed expression on my face. What's the problem, lad? he asked. Come on, spit it out. Don't be afraid to ask questions. I didn't understand all that you said about witches, I said. I don't know what malevolent means or benign either. Malevolent means evil, he explained. Benign means good. And an unaware witch means a witch who doesn't know she's a witch. And because she's a woman, that makes her double trouble. Never trust a woman. My mother's a woman, I said, suddenly feeling a little angry. And I trust her. Mothers usually are women, said the spook, and mothers are usually quite trustworthy, as long as you're their son. Otherwise, look out. 
I had a mother once, and I trusted her, so I remember the feeling well. Do you like girls? he asked suddenly. I don't really know any girls, I admitted. I don't have any sisters. Well, in that case, you could fall easy victim to their tricks. So watch out for the village girls, especially any who wear pointy shoes. Jot that down. It's as good a place to start as any. I wondered what was so terrible about wearing pointy shoes. I knew my ma'am wouldn't be happy with what the spook had just said. She believed you should take people as you find them, not just depend on someone else's opinion. Still, what choice did I have? So at the top of the very first page, I wrote down, Village Girls with Pointy Shoes. He watched me write, then asked for the book and pen. Look, he said, you're going to have to take notes faster than that. There's a lot to learn, and you'll have filled a dozen notebooks before long. But for now, three or four headings will be enough to get you started. He then wrote, Harry Boggarts at the top of page two, then Hall Knockers at the top of page three, then finally, Witches at the top of page four. There, he said. That's got you started. Just write anything you learn today under one of those four headings. But now for something more urgent. We need provisions. So go down to the village, or we'll go hungry tomorrow. Even the best cook can't cook without provisions. Remember that everything goes inside my sack. The butcher has it, so go there first. Just ask for Mr. Gregory's order. He gave me a small silver coin, warning me not to lose my change, then sent me off down the hill on the quickest route to the village. Soon I was walking through trees again, until at last I reached a stile that brought me onto a steep, narrow lane. A hundred or so paces lower, I turned a corner, and the gray slates of Chippenden's rooftops came into view. The village was larger than I'd expected. There were at least a hundred cottages, then a pub, a schoolhouse, and a big church with a bell tower. There was no sign of a market square, but the cobbled main street, which sloped quite steeply, was full of women with loaded baskets scurrying in and out of shops. Horses and carts were waiting on both sides of the street, so it was clear that the local farmers' wives came here to shop and... No doubt, also folk from hamlets nearby. I found the butcher's shop without any trouble and joined a queue of boisterous women, all calling out to the butcher, a cheerful, big, red-faced man with a ginger beard. He seemed to know every single one of them by name, and they kept laughing loudly at his jokes, which came thick and fast. I didn't understand most of them, but the women certainly did, and they really seemed to be enjoying themselves. Nobody paid me much attention, but at last I reached the counter and it was my turn to be served. I've called for Mr. Gregory's order, I told the butcher. As soon as I'd spoken, the shop became quiet and the laughter stopped. The butcher reached behind the counter and pulled out a large sack. I could hear people whispering behind me, but even straining my ears, I couldn't quite catch what they were saying. When I glanced behind, they were looking everywhere but at me. Some were even staring down at the floor. I gave the butcher the silver coin, checked my change carefully, thanked him, and carried the sack out of the shop swinging it up onto my shoulder when I reached the street. The visit to the greengrocer's took no time at all. The provisions there were already wrapped, so I put the parcel in the sack, which was now starting to feel a bit heavy. Until then, everything had gone well, but as I went into the baker's, I saw the gang of lads. There were seven or eight of them sitting on a garden wall. Nothing odd about that, except for the fact that they weren't speaking to one another. They were all busy staring at me with hungry faces like a pack of wolves watching every step I took as I approached the baker's. When I came out of the shop, they were still there, and now, as I began to climb the hill, they started to follow me. Well, although it was too much of a coincidence to think that they'd just decided to go up the same hill, I wasn't that worried. Six brothers had given me plenty of practice at fighting. I heard the sound of their boots getting closer and closer. They were catching up with me pretty quickly, but maybe that was because I was walking slower and slower, you see, I didn't want them to think I was scared, and in any case, the sack was heavy, and the hill I was climbing was very steep. They caught up with me about a dozen paces before the stile, just at the point where the lane divided a small wood. The trees crowding in on either side shut out the morning sun. Open the sack, and let's see what we've got, said a voice behind me. It was a loud, deep voice accustomed to telling people what to do. There was a hard edge of danger that told me its owner liked to cause pain and was always looking for his next victim. I turned to face him, but gripped the sack even tighter, keeping it firmly on my shoulder. The one who'd spoken was the leader of the gang. There was no doubt about that. 
The rest of them had thin, pinched faces, as if they were in need of a good meal, but he looked as if he'd been eating for all of them. He was at least a head taller than me, with broad shoulders and a neck like a bull's. His face was broad, too, with red cheeks, but his eyes were very small, and he didn't seem to blink at all. I suppose if he hadn't been there and hadn't tried to bully me, I might have relented. After all, some of the boys looked half-starved, and there were a lot of apples and cakes in the sack. On the other hand, they weren't mine to give away. This doesn't belong to me, I said. It belongs to Mr. Gregory. His last apprentice didn't let that bother him, said the leader, moving his big face closer to mine. He used to open the sack for us. If you've any sense, you'll do the same. If you won't do it the easy way, then it'll have to be the hard way. But you won't like that very much, and it'll all come down to the same thing in the end. The gang began to move in closer, and I could feel someone behind me tugging at the sack. Even then, I wouldn't let go, and I stared back into the piggy eyes of the leader, trying hard not to blink. At that moment, something happened that took us all by surprise. There was a movement in the trees somewhere to my right, and we all turned toward it. There was a dark shape in the shadows, and as my eyes adjusted to the gloom, I saw that it was a girl. She was moving slowly in our direction, but her approach was so silent that you could have heard a pin drop, and so smooth that she seemed to be floating rather than walking. And she stopped just on the edge of the tree shadows, as if she didn't want to step into the sunlight. Why don't you leave him be? she demanded. It seemed like a question, but the tone in her voice told me it was a command. What's it to you? asked the leader of the gang, jutting his chin forward and bunching his fists. Ain't me you need to worry about, she answered from the shadows. Lizzie's back, and if you don't do what I say, it's her you'll answer to. Lizzie, asked the lad, taking a step backward. Bony Lizzie. She's my aunt. Don't tell me you ain't heard of her. Have you ever felt time slow so much that it almost appears to stop? Ever listened to a clock when the next tick seems to take forever to follow the last talk? Well, it was just like that. Very suddenly, the girl hissed loudly through her clenched teeth. Then she spoke again. Go on, she said. Be off with you. Be gone. Be quick or be dead. The effect on the gang was immediate. I glimpsed the expression on some of their faces and saw that they weren't just afraid. They were terrified and close to panic. Their leader turned on his heels and immediately fled down the hill, with the others close behind him. I didn't know why they were so scared, but I felt like running too. The girl was staring at me with wide eyes, and I didn't feel able to control my limbs properly. I felt like a mouse, paralyzed by the stare of a stoat, about to pounce at any moment. I forced my left foot to move and slowly turned my body toward the trees to follow the direction my nose was pointing, but I was still gripping the spook's sack. Whoever she was, I still wasn't going to give it up. Aren't you going to run as well? She asked me. I shook my head, but my mouth was very dry and I couldn't trust myself to try and speak. I knew the words would come out wrong. She was probably about my own age, if anything, slightly younger. Her face was nice enough, for she had large brown eyes, high cheekbones and long black hair. She wore a black dress tied tightly at the waist with a piece of white string. But as I took all this in... I suddenly noticed something that troubled me. The girl was wearing pointy shoes, and immediately I remembered the spook's warning. But I stood my ground, determined not to run like the others. Ain't you going to thank me? She asked. Be nice to get some thanks. Thanks, I said lamely, just managing to get the word out first time. Well, that's a start, she said. But to thank me properly, you need to give me something, don't you? A cake and an apple will do for now. It ain't much to ask. There's plenty in the sack, and old Gregory won't notice, and if he does, he won't say anything. I was shocked to hear her call the spook old Gregory. I knew he wouldn't like being called that, and it told me two things. First, the girl had little respect for him, and second, she wasn't the least bit afraid of him. Back where I come from, most people shivered even at the thought that the spook might be in the neighborhood. I'm sorry, I said, but I can't do that. They're not mine to give. She glared at me hard then and didn't speak for a long time. I thought at one point that she was going to hiss at me through her teeth. I stared back at her, trying not to blink, until at last a faint smile lit up her face, and she spoke again. Then I'll have to settle for a promise. A promise? I asked, wondering what she meant. 
a promise to help me, just as I helped you. I don't need any help right now, but perhaps one day I might. That's fine, I told her. If you ever need any help in the future, then just ask. What's your name? She asked, giving me a really broad smile. Tom Ward. Well, my name's Alice, and I live yonder, she said, pointing back through the trees. I'm Boney Lizzie's favorite niece. Boney Lizzie was a strange name, but it would have been rude to mention it. Whoever she was, her name had been enough to scare the village lads. That was the end of our conversation. We both turned then to go our separate ways, but as we walked away, Alice called over her shoulder. Take care now. You don't want to end up like old Gregory's last apprentice. What happened to him? I asked. Better ask old Gregory, she shouted as she disappeared back into the trees. When I got back, the spook checked the contents of the sack carefully, ticking things off from a list. Did you have any trouble down in the village? He asked when he'd finally finished. Some lads followed me up the hill and asked me to open the sack, but I told them no, I said. That was very brave of you, said the spook. Next time it won't do any harm to let them have a few apples and cakes. Life's hard enough as it is, but some of them come from very poor families. I always order extra in case they ask for some. I felt annoyed then. If only he'd told me that in advance. I didn't like to do it without asking you first, I said. The spook raised his eyebrows. Did you want to give them a few apples and cakes? I don't like being bullied, I said, but some of them did look really hungry. Then next time, trust your instincts and use your initiative, said the spook. Trust the voice inside you. It's rarely wrong. A spook depends a lot on that because it can sometimes mean the difference between life and death. So that's another thing we need to find out about you. Whether or not your instincts can be relied on. He paused, staring at me hard, his green eyes searching my face. Any trouble with girls? he asked suddenly. It was because I was still annoyed that I didn't give a straight answer to his question. No trouble at all, I answered. It wasn't a lie, because Alice had helped me, which was the opposite of trouble. Still, I knew he really meant had I met any girls, and I knew I should have told him about her, especially with her wearing pointy shoes. I made lots of mistakes as an apprentice. And that was my second serious one, not telling the spook the whole truth. The first, even more serious one, was making the promise to Alice. Chapter 7 Someone Has to Do It After that, my life settled into a busy routine. The spook taught me fast and made me write until my wrist ached and my eyes stung. One afternoon he took me to the far end of the village, beyond the last stone cottage to a small circle of willow trees, which are called withy trees in the county. It was a gloomy spot, and there, hanging from a branch, was a rope. I looked up and saw a big brass bell. When people need help, said the spook, they don't come up to the house. Nobody comes unless they're invited. I'm strict about that. They come down here and ring that bell. Then we go to them. The trouble was that even after weeks had gone by, nobody came to ring the bell, and I only ever got to go farther than the Western Garden when it was time to go fetch the weekly provisions from the village. I was lonely, too, missing my family, so it was a good job the spook kept me busy. That meant I didn't have time to dwell on it. I always went to bed tired and fell asleep as soon as my head hit the pillow. The lessons were the most interesting part of each day, but I didn't learn much about ghasts, ghosts, and witches. The spook had told me that the main topic in an apprentice's first year was boggarts, together with such subjects as botany, which meant learning all about plants, some of which were really useful as medicines or could be eaten if you had no other food. But my lessons weren't just writing. Some of the work was just as hard and physical as anything I'd done back home on our farm. It started on a warm, sunny morning when the spook told me to put away my notebook and led the way toward his southern garden. He gave me two things to carry a spade, and a long measuring rod. Free boggarts travel down lays, he explained. But sometimes something goes wrong. It can be the result of a storm, or maybe even an earthquake. In the county, there hasn't been a serious earthquake in living memory, but that doesn't matter, because lays are all interconnected, and something happening to one even a thousand miles away can disturb all the others. Then, boggarts get stuck in the same place for years 
and we call them naturally bound. Often they can't move more than a few dozen paces in any direction, and they cause little trouble, not unless you happen to get too close to one. Sometimes, though, they can be stuck in awkward places, close to a house, or even inside one. Then you might need to move the boggart from there and artificially bind it elsewhere. What's a lay? I asked. Not everybody agrees, lad, he told me. Some think they are just ancient paths that crisscross the land, paths our forefathers walked in ancient times when men were real men and darkness knew its place. Health was better, lives were longer, and everyone was happy and content. What happened? Ice moved down from the north and the earth grew cold for thousands of years, the spook explained. It was so difficult to survive that men forgot everything they'd learned. The old knowledge was unimportant. Keeping warm and eating was all that mattered. When the ice finally pulled back, the survivors were hunters dressed in animal skins. They'd forgotten how to grow crops and husband animals. Darkness was all-powerful. Well, it's better now, although we still have a long way to go. All that's left of those times are the lays. But the truth is, they're more than just paths. Lays are really lines of power far beneath the earth. Secret invisible roads that free boggarts can use to travel at great speed. It's these free boggarts that cause the most trouble. When they set up home in a new location, often they're not welcome. Not being welcome makes them angry. They play tricks, sometimes dangerous tricks, and that means work for us. Then they need to be artificially bound in a pit, just like the one that you're going to dig now. This is a good place, he said, pointing at the ground near a big ancient oak tree. I think there should be enough space between the roots. The spook gave me a measuring rod so that I could make the pit exactly six feet long, six feet deep, and three feet wide. Even in the shade it was too warm to be digging, and it took me hours and hours to get it right because the spook was a perfectionist. After digging the pit, I had to prepare a smelly mixture of salt, iron filings, and a special sort of glue made from bones. Salt can burn a boggart, said the spook. Iron, on the other hand, earths things. Just as lightning finds its way to earth and loses its power, iron can sometimes bleed away the strength and substance of things that haunt the dark. It can end the mischief of troublesome boggarts. Used together, salt and iron form a barrier that a boggart can't cross. In fact, salt and iron can be useful in lots of situations. After stirring up the mixture in a big metal bucket, I used a large brush to line the inside of the pit. It was like painting, but harder work, and the coating had to be perfect in order to stop even the craftiest boggart from escaping. Do a thorough job, lad, the spook told me. A boggart can escape through a hole no bigger than a pinhead. Of course, as soon as the pit was completed to the spook's satisfaction, I had to fill it in and begin again. He had me digging two practice pits a week, which was hard, sweaty work and took up a lot of my time. It was a bit scary, too, because I was working near pits that contained real boggarts, and even in daylight, it was a creepy place. I noticed that the spook never went too far away, though, and he always seemed watchful and alert, telling me you could never take chances with boggarts, even when they were bound. The spook also told me that I'd need to know every inch of the county, all its towns and villages, and the quickest route between any two points. The trouble was that although the spook said he had lots of maps upstairs in his library, it seemed I always had to do things the hard way, so he started me off by making me draw a map of my own. At its center was his house and gardens, and it had to include the village and the nearest of the fells. The idea was that it would gradually get bigger to include more and more of the surrounding countryside. But drawing wasn't my strong point, and, as I said, the spook was a perfectionist, so the map took a long time to grow. It was only then that he started to show me his own maps, but he made me spend more time carefully folding them up afterward than actually studying them. I also began to keep a diary. The spook gave me another notebook for this, telling me for the umpteenth time that I needed to record the past so that I could learn from it. I didn't write in it every day, though. Sometimes I was too tired, and sometimes my wrist was aching too much from scribbling at top speed in my other notebook while trying to keep up with what the spook said. Then, one morning at breakfast, when I'd been staying with the spook for just one month, he asked, What do you think so far, lad? I wondered if he were talking about the breakfast. 
Perhaps there'd be a second course to make up for the bacon, which had been a bit burned that morning. So I just shrugged. I didn't want to offend the Bogart, which was probably listening. Well, it's a hard job, and I wouldn't blame you for deciding to give it up now, he said. After the first months passed, I always give each new apprentice the chance to go home and think very carefully about whether he wants to carry on or not. Would you like to do the same? I did my best not to seem too eager, but I couldn't keep the smile off my face. The trouble was the more I smiled, the more miserable the spook looked. I got the feeling that he wanted me to stay, but I couldn't wait to be off. The thought of seeing my family again and getting to taste ma'am's cooking seemed like a dream. I left for home within the hour. You're a brave lad, and your wits are sharp, he said to me at the gate. You've passed your month's trial, so you can tell your dad that. If you want to carry on, I'll be visiting him in the autumn to collect my ten guineas. You've the makings of a good apprentice, but it's up to you, lad. If you don't come back, then I'll know you've decided against it. Otherwise, I'll expect you back within the week. Then I'll give you five years' training that'll make you almost as good at the job as I am. I set off for home with a light heart. You see, I didn't want to tell the spook, but the moment he'd given me the chance to go home and maybe never come back, I'd already made up my mind to do just that. It was a terrible job. From what the spook had told me, apart from the loneliness, it was dangerous and terrifying. Nobody really cared whether you lived or died. They just wanted you to get rid of whatever was plaguing them, but didn't think for a second about what it might cost you. The spook had described how he'd once been half-killed by a boggart. It had changed in the blink of an eye from a hall knocker to a stone chucker, and had nearly brained him with a rock as big as a blacksmith's fist. He said that he hadn't even been paid yet, but expected to get the money next spring. Well, next spring was a long time off, so what good was that? As I set off for home, it seemed to me that I'd be better off working on the farm. The trouble was, it was nearly two days' journey, and walking gave me a lot of time to think. I remembered how bored I'd sometimes been on the farm. Could I really put up with working there for the rest of my life? Next, I started to think about what Mam would say. She'd been really set on me being the spook's apprentice, and if I stopped, I'd really let her down. So the hardest part would be telling her and watching her reaction. By nightfall on the first day of my journey home, I'd finished all the cheese the spook had given me for the trip. So the next day, I only stopped once, to bathe my feet in a stream, reaching home just before the evening milking. As I opened the gate to the yard, Dad was heading for the cowshed. When he saw me, his face lit up with a broad smile. I offered to help with the milking so we could talk, but he told me to go in right away and speak to my ma'am. She's missed ya, lad. You'll be a sight for sore eyes. Patting me on the back, he went off to do his milking, but before I'd taken half a dozen paces, Jack came out of the barn and made straight for me. What brings you back so soon? he asked. He seemed a bit cool. Well, to be honest, he was more cold than cool. His face was sort of twisted up, as if he were trying to scowl and grin at the same time. The spook sent me home for a few days. I've got to make up my mind whether to carry on or not. So what will you do? I'm going to talk to Mam about it. No doubt you get your own way, as usual, Jack said. By now Jack was definitely scowling, and it made me feel that something had happened while I'd been away. Why else was he suddenly so unfriendly? Was it because he didn't want me coming home? And I can't believe you took Dad's tinderbox, he said. He gave it to me, I said. He wanted me to have it. He offered it, but that didn't mean you had to take it. The trouble with you is, you only think about yourself. Think of poor Dad... He loved that tinderbox. I didn't say anything because I didn't want to get into an argument. I knew he was wrong. Dad had wanted me to have the tinderbox. I was sure of it. While I'm back, I'll be able to help out, I said, trying to change the subject. If you really want to earn your keep, then feed the pigs, he called as he turned to walk away. It was a job neither of us liked much. They were big, hairy, smelly pigs and always so hungry that it was never safe to turn your back on them. Despite what Jack had said, I was still glad to be home. As I crossed the yard, I glanced up at the house. Mam's climbing roses covered most of the wall at the back and always did well, even though they faced north. Now they were just shooting, but by mid-June they'd be covered in red blossoms. The back door was always jamming because the house had once been struck by lightning. The door had caught fire and had been replaced, but the frame was still slightly warped, so I had to push hard to force it open. It was worth it because the first thing I saw was Mam's smiling face. She was sitting in her old rocking chair in the far corner of the kitchen, a place where the setting sun couldn't reach. 
If the light was too bright, it hurt her eyes. Ma'am preferred winter to summer and night to day. She was glad to see me all right, and at first I tried to delay telling her I'd come home to stay. I put on a brave face and pretended to be happy, but she saw right through me. I could never hide anything from her. What's wrong? she asked. I shrugged and tried to smile, probably doing even worse than my brother at disguising my feelings. Speak up, she said. There's no point in keeping it bottled up. I didn't answer for a long time because I was trying to find a way to put it into words. The rhythm of Mam's rocking chair gradually slowed until at last it came to a complete halt. That was always a bad sign. I've passed my month's trial, and Mr. Gregory says it's up to me whether I carry on or not. But I'm lonely, ma'am, I confessed at last. It's just as bad as I expected. I've got no friends, nobody of my own age to talk to. I feel so alone. I'd like to come back and work here. I could have said more and told her how happy we used to be on the farm when all my brothers were living at home. I didn't. I knew that she missed them, too. I thought she'd be sympathetic because of that, but I was wrong. There was a long pause before Mam spoke, and I could hear Ellie sweeping up in the next room, singing softly to herself as she worked. Lonely? Mam asked, her voice full of anger rather than sympathy. How can you be lonely? You've got yourself, haven't you? If you ever lose yourself, then you'll be really lonely. In the meantime, stop complaining. You're nearly a man now, and a man has to work. Ever since the world began, men have been doing jobs they didn't like. Why should it be any different for you? You're the seventh son of a seventh son, and this is the job you were born to do. But Mr. Gregory's trained other apprentices, I blurted out. One of them could come back and look after the county. Why does it have to be me? He's trained many, but precious few completed their time, Ma'am said, and those that did aren't a patch on him. They're flawed, or weak, or cowardly. They walk a twisted path, taking money for accomplishing little. So there's only you left now, son. You're the last chance. The last hope. Someone has to do it. Someone has to stand against the dark. And you're the only one who can. The chair began to rock again, slowly picking up speed. Well, I'm glad that's settled. Do you want to wait for supper, or shall I put you some out as soon as it's ready? Ma'am asked. I've had nothing to eat all day, ma'am. Not even breakfast. Well, it's rabbit stew. That ought to cheer you up a bit. I sat at the kitchen table feeling as low and sad as I could ever remember while Ma'am bustled about the stove. The rabbit stew smelled delicious and my mouth began to water. Nobody was a better cook than my Ma'am, and it was worth coming home even for just a single meal. With a smile, Ma'am carried across a big steaming plate of stew and set it down before me. I'll go and make up your room, she said. Now you're here, you might as well stay a couple of days. I mumbled my thanks and wasted no time in starting. As soon as Ma'am went upstairs, Ellie came into the kitchen. Nice to see you back, Tom, she said with a smile. And she looked down at my generous plate of food. Would you like some bread with that? Yes, please, I said, and Ellie buttered me three thick slices before sitting at the table opposite me. I finished it all without once coming up for air, finally wiping my plate clean with the last big slice of freshly baked bread. Feel better now? I nodded and tried to smile, but I knew it hadn't worked properly because Ellie suddenly looked worried. I couldn't help overhearing what you told your ma'am, she said. I'm sure it's not as bad as all that. It's just because the job's all new and strange. You'll soon get used to the work. Anyway, you don't have to go back right away. After a few days at home, you'll feel better. And you'll always be welcome here, even when the farm belongs to Jack. I don't think Jack's that pleased to see me. Why, what makes you say that? Ellie asked. He just didn't seem that friendly, that's all. I don't think he wants me here. Don't you worry about your big, mean brother. I can sort him out easily enough. I smiled properly then, because it was true. As my ma'am once said, Ellie could twist Jack round her little finger. What's mainly bothering him is this, Ellie said, smoothing her hand down across her belly. My mother's sister died in childbirth, and our family still talks of it to this day. It's made Jack nervous, but I'm not bothered at all because I couldn't be in a better place with your ma'am to look after me. She paused. But there is something else. Your new job worries him. He seemed happy enough about it before I went away, I said. He was doing that for you, because you're his brother, and he cares about you. But the work a spook does frightens people, makes them uneasy. I suppose if you'd left right away, it would probably have been all right. But Jack said that on the day you left, 
you went straight up over the hill into the wood, and that since then the dogs have been uneasy. Now they won't even go into the north pasture. Jack thinks you've stirred something up. I suppose it all comes back to this, Ellie went on, patting her belly gently. He's just being protective, that's all. He's thinking of his family. But don't worry. It'll all sort itself out eventually. In the end, I stayed three days, trying to put on a brave face, but eventually I sensed it was time to go. Ma'am was the last person I saw before I left. We were alone in the kitchen, and she gave my arm a squeeze and told me that she was proud of me. You're more than just seven times seven, she said, smiling at me warmly. You're my son, too, and you have the strength to do what has to be done. I nodded in agreement because I wanted her to be happy, but the smile slipped from my face just as soon as I left the yard. I trudged back to the spook's house with my heart right down in my boots, feeling hurt and disappointed that Ma'am wouldn't have me back home. It rained all the way back to Chippenden, and when I arrived I was cold, wet, and miserable. But as I reached the front gate, to my surprise the latch lifted on its own, and the gate swung open without me touching it. It was a sort of welcome, an encouragement to go in, something I'd thought was reserved only for the spook. I suppose I should have been pleased by that, but I wasn't. It just felt creepy. I knocked at the door three times before I finally noticed that the key was in the lock. As my knocking had brought no response, I turned the key, then eased the door open. I checked all the downstairs rooms but one. Then I called up the stairs. There was no answer, so I risked going into the kitchen. There was a fire blazing in the grate, and the table was set for one. At its center was a huge, steaming hot pot. I was so hungry I helped myself and had almost polished off the lot when I saw the note under the salt shaker. Gone east to Pendle. It's witch trouble, so I'll be away for some time. Make yourself at home, but don't forget to pick up this week's provisions. As usual, the butcher has my sack, so go there first. Pendle was a big fell, almost a mountain, really, far to the east of the county. That whole district was infested with witches and was a risky place to go, especially alone. It reminded me again of how dangerous the spook's job could be. But at the same time, I couldn't help feeling a bit annoyed. All that time waiting for something to happen, and the moment I'm away, the spook goes off without me. I slept well that night, but not so deeply that I failed to hear the bell summoning me to breakfast. I went downstairs on time and was rewarded with the best plate of bacon and eggs I'd eaten in the spook's house. I was so pleased that just before leaving the table, I spoke out loud, using the words that my dad said every Sunday after lunch. That was really good, I said. My compliments to the cook. No sooner had I spoken than the fire flared up in the grate and a cat began to purr. I couldn't see a cat, but the noise it was making was so loud that I'll swear the window panes were rattling. It was obvious that I'd said the right thing. So, feeling right pleased with myself, I set off for the village to pick up the provisions. The sun was shining out of a blue cloudless sky, the birds were singing, and after the previous day's rain, the whole world seemed bright and gleaming and new. I started at the butcher's, collected the spook sack, moved on to the greengrocer's, and finished at the baker's. Some village lads were leaning against the wall nearby. There weren't as many as last time, and their leader, the big lad with the neck like a bull's, wasn't with them. Remembering what the spook had said, I walked straight up to them. I'm sorry about last time, I said, but I'm new and didn't understand the rules properly. Mr. Gregory said that you can have an apple and a cake each. So saying, I opened the sack and handed each lad just what I'd promised. Their eyes opened so wide that they almost popped out of their sockets, and each muttered his thanks. At the top of the lane, someone was waiting for me. It was the girl called Alice, and once again she was standing in the shadow of the trees as if she didn't like the sunlight. You can have an apple and a cake, I told her. To my surprise, she shook her head. I'm not hungry at the moment, she said. But there's something that I do want. I need you to keep your promise. I need some help. I shrugged. A promise is a promise, and I remembered making it. So what else could I do but keep my word? Tell me what you want, and I'll do my best, I replied. Once more, her face lit up into a really broad smile. She wore a black dress and had pointy shoes, but that smile somehow made me forget all that. Still, what she said next set me worrying and quite spoiled the rest of the day. I ain't going to tell you now, she said. Tell you this evening I will, just as the sun goes down. Come to me when you hear old Gregory's bell. I heard the bell just before sunset, and with a heavy heart went down the hill toward the circle of willow trees where the lanes crossed. It didn't seem right, her ringing the bell like that. 
Not unless she had work for the spook, but somehow I doubted that. Far above, the last rays of the sun were bathing the summits of the fells in a faint orange glow, but down below, among the withy trees, it was gray and full of shadows. I shivered when I saw the girl, because she was pulling the rope with just one hand, yet making the clappers of the big bell dance wildly. Despite her slim arms and narrow waist, she had to be very strong. She stopped ringing as soon as I showed my face and rested her hands on her hips while the branches continued to dance and shake overhead. We just stared at each other for ages, until my eyes were drawn down toward a basket at her feet. There was something inside it covered with a black cloth. She lifted the basket and held it out to me. What is it? I asked. It's for you, so that you can keep your promise. I accepted it, but I wasn't feeling very happy. Curious, I reached inside to lift the black cloth. No, leave it be, Alice snapped, a sharp edge to her voice. Don't let the air get to them or they'll spoil. What are they? I asked. It was growing darker by the minute and I was starting to feel nervous. They're just cakes. Thank you very much, I said. They're not for you, she said, a little smile playing at the corners of her mouth. Those cakes are for old Mother Malkin. My mouth became dry, and a chill ran down my spine. Mother Malkin, the live witch the spook kept in a pit in his garden. I don't think Mr. Gregory would like it, I said. He told me to keep away from her. He's a very cruel man, old Gregory, said Alice. Poor Mother Malkin's been in that damp, dark hole in the ground for almost thirteen years now. Is it right to treat an old woman so badly? I shrugged. I hadn't been happy about it myself. It was hard to defend what he'd done, but he'd said there was a very good reason for it. Look, she said, you won't get into trouble, because old Gregory need never know. There's just comfort you're bringing to her. Her favourite cakes, made by family. Ain't nothing wrong with that. Just something to keep her strength against the cold. Gets right into her bones, it does. Once again I shrugged. All the best arguments seemed to belong to her. So just give her a cake each night. Three cakes for three nights. Best do it at midnight, because it's then that she gets most peckish. Give her the first one tonight. Alice turned to go, but stopped and turned to give me a smile. We could become good friends, you and me, she said with a chuckle. Then she disappeared into the deepening shadows. This ends Disc 2.